I'm delighted to um, have invited Sabina and for her to agree to, to do this presentation. Um, I, I, we met in Berlin at an improvisation conference uh, earlier at the beginning of this year, back before um, any of this madness hit us with the pandemic. Um, and I'm also aware of her work for some time uh, through various other collaborators and colleagues of mine, um, some of which also work with John at Newcastle, Bennett Hogg. Um, so it's great to have you here, wherever here is uh, for you, for all of you. Uh, and, and we're also hoping to bring you over again uh, for a concert once that becomes possible in the future. But I won't say too much more about um, Sabina because she'll probably t do a bit of an introduction on her background herself. Um, just admitting a few more people as they arrive here. Um, so yes, uh, thank you and I'll, I'll hand you over to Sabina, thank you. Thanks Paul, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm very excited to share um, some of my work with you today. And I think I should do the sharing, bildschirm sharing now. Oops. Um, yeah. So I'm talking about uh, my project Recorded Landscapes today. And first of all, um, a little bit of my, my history, my background. I am basically a flute player in the field of contemporary music and improvisation. And I always was uh, interested in extended techniques. And then I started also to use electronics. Um, Stein built controllers, food controllers for me, ancestral controllers. And I worked with the computer and um, sampling. But I also was, uh, for a long time, I'm very interested in working with field recordings. So I did a lot of compositions or improvisations uh, with the mixture of field recordings and my flute playing. And I also um, have a tiny little microphone that I, is, is, uh, that I put inside the flutes so that I can amplify the inside sound world of my flutes. So it's basically then the, the mix of my inside flute sound world and the outside with the field recordings. And uh, in 2012, Bennett, Dr. Bennett Hawk from the University of Newcastle asked me to be part of the artistic research project uh, Landscape Quartet. Maybe some of you have heard about it. And this, is, uh, this was a project funded by a ARRC and it was about improvising in and in relation with the natural environment and going in a directly dialogue with the natural environment. I was very excited about this and it uh, involved were Dr. Bennett Hawk, then Dr. Matthew Sansom, who was at the Surrey University at this time, now he's in Malaysia, and Stefan Oesterhue. And so we were four uh, and we, we did a lot of field work outside and did a lot of work also inside. And uh, in this time, a lot of solo work happened for me and I developed something I called tuning in. And this is a method uh, how I, I, I start to approach my work outside. It's, it's like a way of walking very slow and perceiving the environment um, with all my senses. And um, in 2012, beginning of 2012, I did a bushwalk with an Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal in the Blue Mountains and he told me to go very slow, to taste, to touch, to smell and this is the way what they say they go in dream time and this is uh, how you go in connection with your ancestors, with the spirit world, with the environment and I did part of this already beforehand but this kind of gave me even more a stronger idea for my work, like really to follow this path. And um, so when I, I did a work together with Matthew Sensum and we both didn't talk at all the whole day and I was sitting for hours at one spot. And then very slowly, um, or sometimes also fast, it can happen that then a creative response is coming. And I, um, I had, four kind of categories oh this is the tuning in this is really like the slow walking and breathing and smelling and so i have four categories or like four 
issues I'm, I'm dividing it in. So the first um, creative outcome can be like a very immediate creative response, which can be just sitting there in the, f in the woods and play my flute or I use objects that I find on site and, and improvise with them. The second one is the creation of work on site, typically sound installations either with or without live performance. And this can be like that I have uh, recorded material that I then later put in little transducer speakers, which I mount in nature somewhere on, on objects I find there, or sometimes I build aeolian harps. It can be all kinds of stuff. And um, I do also, very often I do also play live to this sound installation. The third one, Quite common one is producing electroacoustic and or audiovisual pieces with material from the site. I guess that's, that's uh, many people do this. And then the fourth one is developing new pieces inside a space that are influenced by the work from outside. And there's one um, example I had just, uh, I did with Bennett also and Dr. Dennis uh, Peter, Peters at the Kunst Uni Graz, he invited me as a guest research for his project uh, emotional uh, improvisation and we did a we did a piece called um, nature table and this was informed by work Bennett and I did outside in the Alps we had like aeolian harps and flutes hanging connected with a fishing line and violins and stuff and then we built a completely new piece inside with the grand piano of um, Dennis connecting fishing line uh, to walls and, and the strings of the, of the grand piano and hanging flutes on it and stuff. So this was a completely new thing, but it was informed by the work from outside. I want to show you now one video um, that I did in 2014. Uh, it's called Cairn, and this was at the Allen Heads Contemporary Arts Center. We had a meeting with, with uh, Landscape Quartet there. And the first day I was really tuning in. It was my first time in Allen Heads, and I was walking around, and there was this hill. And it was really, I was really drawn to this hill, but somehow I didn't walk up. But um, I really had a very strong feeling. It was almost calling me. And the next day I woke up, and I knew I have to go up there. And I knew what I have to bring. I have to bring all my Bansuris. These are, um, the Bansuris are uh, Indian bamboo flutes, and I have quite some of them in different size. And I brought all my recording gear. At this time, I just had a tablet for video recording. And I walked uphill and had a lot of, and just like opened all my senses, like about the environment. It was, it's a former lead mining area and I could feel like kind of the exploiting of the earth and everything. And it was super cold and this is what happened, just an extract of the video.
So this was Cairn and out of this material, um, I created an audiovisual installation, which was first premiered at the University Newcastle and you had to climb up to the top of the building to the staircase. Uh, and I used um, several different sized speakers to as an um, I had this different sized flutes out there and then I used different sized speakers where the the sound of the flutes came through and I also played live to it. Um, so the, yeah, this is Cairn. This was Cairn just like a, as an example of, of outcome from the tuning in. And then um, later I came up with the idea with the recorded landscape and actually this happened uh, in Australia <laughs> at the Clovelly Beach. A rock formation manifests the process process by which a landscape has emerged, a recording process of movement and evolution. Visual details of such formations can be treated as graphic scores to be played, transforming landscape into sound, and this again can be recorded. A recorded landscape is therefore the manifestation of the process of an emerging, lands emerging landscape. So I was at the Clovelly Beach and I had my piccolo flute with me and a the, my recording machine and the tablet and um, I, I did just some playing there. I had an idea and then I photographed details of the beach and later I uh, created it an audiovisual composition which is uh, a fixed media composition now but I, it's also existing as a live piece and this is an extra out of it. And at this time, I also read um, The Old Ways from Robert McFarlane. And there was one sentence that really hits me. Um, this is the quote. For some time now, it has seemed to me that the two questions we should ask for any strong landscape are these. Firstly, what do I know when I am in this place that I can know nowhere else? And then, vainly, what does this place know of me that I cannot know of myself? So I came up with this idea to visit more places in nature and, and do pieces like this, but also as also a way of tuning in with colleagues to, to visit homelands of different musicians or different people that they show me their homelands and we create a piece there together. So I was lucky enough, I got funding last year to do the first edition, Recorded Landscapes number one. And uh, it was together with Marta Saperoli, sound artist who lives in Berlin but is from Italy, with Biljana Vuchkova, violinist from Bulgaria. Then again with Bennett Hawk, 
in Northumberland. And then I did one solo piece uh, at the lakes where I grew up in Bavaria. And out of this material I, I recorded with everybody, uh, the idea was to do audiovisual compositions and then do a live performance, a live concert with all of them. Unfortunately, it was clear that Biana won't be there for the, for the concert, so uh, the piece with Biana is a fixed media, became a fixed media piece. But all the others, other pieces uh, were live recorded last October, uh, live performed, sorry, uh, last October. And uh, it was um, very intense times with, with all of them and very different. So the project is about the cultural exchange to know my partners better, better my, my fellow musician partners better. And it's also a search of identity, I, I find out. And uh, the question, where do I come from? We as musicians, we travel a lot. And um, like Bijana and Marta, they don't live at their homelands anymore, and me either. But we still have a very strong connection to it. And I think um, a landscape where we grew up is really influencing who we are and who we become, maybe. And um, so the first piece uh, or the first trip was with Marta and she grew up in a little village close to Verona. And she showed me a place she never ever showed somebody before. It's a place she, she went as a little kid very often when she was seeking for solitude and wanted to think about things or when she was sad. She even didn't share this place with her sister. So it was, uh, it was very special for her also to show me this. Um, and she wrote later about uh, our work. I just read this. To share my intimate land spot with the Wiener, the place where I used to think about life and be alone was a very deep psychologically and sensitive experience. I recorded and shared vibrational sound and signals in the same place where 30 years ago I experienced a deeply personal relationship to the place in solitude. Back then, I heard different sounds than I do now. With the passage of time and through my sonic interaction with the Sabine, everything changed. I felt a new perception of the place, new surroundings, new smells, new sounds and new meanings, and a new way to live and occupy the place. The bridge from the past connected us into a present of deeply sonic, emotional and unique experience, experience which I will never forget. It was like being on a surreal sonic boat moving slowly into the future. Et la barca va. La barca va means uh, the boat is floating. And this is an excerpt of the piece. It's the life it's the live uh, recording. Marta is a sound artist who works a lot with antennas, so she literally tunes into the environment.
So um, the piece with the with Marta, we worked, we experimented on site a lot with layering ideas and things. So we, she had this antennas, and we put first one antenna there, recorded it, I played with it, and then we put the next one. And so we build up. It, it's like like the landscape that's emerging from layers. We also layered the sound and the ideas. The next piece uh, is Doma, which means home in Bulgarian. And this is a place Viljana brought me. It's at the Black Sea coast. It was in summer. And I had to, um, I had to promise the people I met there that I won't tell the name of the place because it's a little paradise and uh, almost no tourists there. So I had to give the promise. Um, so I won't tell. <laughs> but it's a place where Biljana, who is traveling a lot, and she also, like, she left Bulgaria really when she, she still was a teenager. Um, but she said every year since then, she came back to this place and uh, spent at least a week or maybe even even two months there. So that's for her really her roots and a very, very um, important place to be. And um, yeah, she has her, her roots there and um, her parents have land there. So it's, it's really her homelands. And it was very intense. We slept in a tent at the beach. And so we had like the summer holiday feeling, but at the same time, every day we packed our things and went to a certain spot and did recordings there and worked there. And there was one stone which became really important for us. And this is an extract of the piece.
We found these little stones at the beach and um, they really look like scores. So we, we treated them. So this is again a mix of recordings from site and then some recordings back in the back home in the studio, which is with the other pieces then played live was with Biana then played um, in my home and uh, we recorded it. The next piece is um, Howick Haven and uh, Starlight Runner with uh, Bennett Hawk. And we did part of it in Howick, which was also a little bit my wish because this is very, for me also already a very special place. And this is also where the, the idea of um, Landscape Quartet was born. So we felt like this should be part of it. And then uh, it brought me to another place in Seaton Sluice, which he really discovered shortly before I came for the visit. He, he, um, I'm just reading it, what he wrote about it. Howick is a place I visited many times since a school environmental science trip there when I was 11 years old. I have always loved the way that the woods come right down to the sea, something rather unusual in the north of England. Seaton Sluice is very, where I spent most of the weekends of my childhood, staying with my grandparents. My grandfather was gamekeeper there, and my younger brother and I walked the woods and the river valley with him, learning the names of the plants and birds and helping him with his work. The Starlight Runner is a place he used to rear pheasants, but I had not been there for more than 30 years. Rediscovering this magical secluded place just a week before Sabine's arrival to work on the project inspired me to include this in the recorded landscapes explorations. My contribution to the final recorded soundtrack attempts to convey the density of the layers that make up a place, the air, water and earth. Sand, sounds, but also the density of memories and recollection. With Bennett, the, the work as we already used to work in nature or in natural environment a lot. Um, but what was very interesting at this point was that the two of us um, really explored things just on our own. But at this, as we were in the same place together, it was nevertheless like improvising together. But I started to, to do something with my flute in the sand. And, and then he also tried it out. So we not necessarily played together and this was especially at Powick, but because of the action of the other person, uh, it, we were totally inspired uh, and influenced by it. So it was something we did together. And also uh, it was especially the first day we were really listening a lot, um, just f for us. Um, and then every day, Bennett's first idea was like, we go first to Howick, then we go to Seton Sluice. But then we ended up to visit every, every place every day. And so we did every day something at all these places. And there, there also the difference to the other pieces is that um, Bennett also contributed to the sound composition. So it was, it's really a joint composition between the two of us. And this is an extract. It's also from the live recording.
So this was this. And then um, the last piece is a solo uh, by myself. And it's at the, in the, I grew up in the Five Lake District. And there were always, there was always this one lake which is really like when you ask me where's your home I, I it's this lake like jumping into this lake and swimming it's just like feeling somebody is bracing you and this is home for me and the other lake it's uh, Amazi it's when I was sad or lonely or whatever it's a walk at this uh, at the shore of this lake is always very good and also the view into the mountains on a clear day is very great so these are these two places that are very very important for me or well, used to be important and they are still important so every time when I go down there I try to 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 go there and it's it's a solo recording but at the Amazi I had uh, Volker Repan who who did the video recordings and First, I thought I could show you the whole piece because this would have been the piece I would have played in the concert or I will hopefully. Um, but I guess I'm showing a shorter version now so that we have enough time to talk.
Okay. By the way, the, the live documenta video documentation and editing afterwards was done by um, Carlos Bustamante, just to mention him. And um, just something shortly, um, and then I'm, I'm done. Uh, when I, when I uh, org organized this concert, I, I asked myself, um, how can I involve the audience a little bit more into this very special feeling we all had when we created these pieces or when we did the recordings there and were at the special places? That's a question actually I'm really, uh, it's a big question for me and I'm, I want to do more research with it. But the night before we had the concert, I had a dream that I'm doing a tuning in session with the audience before the concert starts. <laughs> and I was a little bit nervous. I was like, well, that's a crazy idea. And then Bennett said, oh, you dreamt it, you have to do it. So no, no <laughs> doubts about this. <laughs> And so I did it, actually. I did, um, I invited them to close their eyes, to imagine a place in nature that they really feel connected to, to, to remember the colors, the smell. It was like a little meditation, like 10 minutes before we started the concert. And a lot of people were super positive about it. They gave me super positive feedback about it, that, the, that it was, it really helped them to watch and listen differently um, than they would have done it before. That's what they thought. Yeah, so that's it. That was my presentation and I'm curious to your questions. And now I stop the sharing here. Great. Um, thank you so much, Serena, for that, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we have a bit of time for questions, you can either type the questions into the chat window, or you can uh, raise your hand if you turn on the video, and I can, and I can call on you. Um, uh, feel free to unmute your microphone, which you can do via the bottom left-hand corner if you want to participate. Uh, and also, um, feel free to unmute your video so we can see your lovely faces. So, uh, <laughs> do, does anybody have any questions to start off? This is always the initial ice breaking uh, of these Zoom sessions. I have quite a few myself. Um, okay. So um, let's. Oh. Hi, Paul. Uh, I have a question. If you want. Okay, okay. Abby. Let's go with let's go with Abby to start with, and then we'll uh, next we'll go with Madeline. I think so. Uh, Madeline, you're on deck. Go, Abby. Go ahead. Um. Uh, hi. Um. Hi. It, it was really good. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, I. And I could imagine some of the places that I love the most, and uh, it was a really uh, touching uh, presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so um, uh, I'm an engineer myself, and uh, okay. uh, and I like um, learning about musical acoustics. So um, um, you mentioned you use a, 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 a microphone inside your flute. So I wanted to know a bit more about that. Um, where do you place it and so on? Yeah. Okay, so that's a, um, I don't have it here. Uh, it's a small, um, I think called Lavia microphone that you put here just to talk or if you have more money, you can get a DPA microphone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it really depends on, uh, often I have it just like in the, in the bottom of the foot of the flute because um, I'm playing normally in a performance, I play piccolo flute, the concert flute and the bass flute. So I can change very quickly. I have just one microphone and I change. But sometimes also it can be interesting to put it deeper. Like I played a piece by Marlin Bong who um, discovered this technique by me. <laughs> And she's writing a lot of pieces with this inside microphone pieces now. And um, so you can put it in the bass foot really deep into it. It really depends on what kind of sound you want to have. And mm -hmm. so, I and I have, I have a volume control pedal so that I'm able to switch it on or off. Otherwise, if it would be always on, then it, you cannot play a normal note. I see. And uh, yeah. this pedal uh, is wired. The... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Abby. Uh, I think uh, Madeline, did you have your yeah. your hand up? Yeah. I, uh, I, I just want to um, continue on that. You said um, 
on that question. You said that if you had the microphone on, you could all the time you couldn't play a normal note. But um, surely having the microphone in the the base of the the, the the flute wouldn't that impede playing a normal note anyhow? That wasn't going to be my question. But okay, I'm but just, uh, um, sorry, what, impede. Um, what, uh, sorry, I don't know the word impede. Um, D disrupt, like the, disrupt, the yeah. yeah. So if, if if it would be always on, then then uh, it's it's very distorted the normal flute playing. So I have, I mean, I sometimes use it as an effect. Uh, so then I have like a distorted sound, but uh, I want to have control over it. But I, so I think is... I, I think her question was even by by putting the it, the microphone ah, in there in the first place. How does does that okay. does that alter does that alter the the sound of the flute in interesting ways or, or, or not? <laughs> ah, okay. No, I, I, I don't think so. I think the flute can still sound normal. Yeah. Okay. Did, did, you, have an, did you have a second yeah. question there, Madeline? Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, this was actually my first question. <laughs> in continuing the series, you know, um, how do you envision continuing that series given the climate of COVID-19? Um, actually, my, my original vision was to, to create pieces all over the world with people and then having, when I'm 90, I have a big ex uh, <laughs> exhibition where all this, it's like a world map with all these different pieces. I'm now with all this climate change thing and traveling, it's getting more difficult. I have to rethink a little bit this um and also now through COVID, you cannot travel i i was supposed to do a piece this year at the toshua tree park together with a saxophone player mm -hmm. and it didn't happen because i couldn't go to the us uh, and now i will start to do a lot of pieces here in, around my home like i'm traveling through brandenburg and doing pieces we see where this all leads like you know where we, if we can continue traveling or if we should stop all traveling anyhow, we, um, even without Corona. Mm. It's a question, yeah. That's a complicated question we're all wrestling yep. with. Um, mm. Right, we have time for a couple more questions. If, if, anybody, if anybody has anything particular. Um, I, I'm definitely interested in this uh, it, a concept of, of tuning in that you're developing. It relates a lot to, in my mind, to also kind of concepts of uh, like deep listening by Pauline Oliveros, or I, I have this kind of concept I'm trying to develop called co-tuning, which is actually, again, very similar, uh, and, and how I, we relate to instruments in our environment and how we kind of co-create each other or co-constitute mm -hmm. each other. So um, I... I, uh, I think I, I particularly liked your description um, because it, it wasn't necessarily just on a kind of sensory level, but it also tapped in, into memory. Uh, and, and, and I guess, so I'm kind of working towards a question, but really I, I think that I'm, I'm curious to hear more about how, so you, you're paying attention very carefully to the landscape and in that process of attention, uh, how, are, how are you changed or reconfigured in, in, in that process? Um, I think I, I changed a lot actually and also my playing has changed and my playing with other people has changed and um, it's the one thing is uh, I out, out there I started to play with objects meanwhile my setup with the flute became more with objects and stuff and preparations and also the kind of a feeling like to tune in with your players beca became really important for me and I like to get a sense of tuning to the space where I'm playing so it's not just nature you can tune into nature you can tune into any place or space where you are and um, I find it's quite interesting and I also I, I mean I didn't analyze it but I think my playing has changed also <laughs> a little bit to go like really more into this listening and um, it's also like the idea of like when you go in the landscape you're a lot of field recording players have this idea 
uh, field recording, rec recording, or like the idea of doing f field recordings is, or used to be, uh, you go there and you record nature, but I think the moment you're entering a landscape, you're influencing it. So you're always part of it. You're always yeah. part of it. And so it's like an ecosystemic thing, idea, and you can have this out there in a big scale, but also when you're on stage with your fellow musicians, you're an ecosystem and you're influenced. The, sure, you play and this influence the people how, how they play. And I think I got more aware about this through my work. That's great. I see lots of nodding from John Bowers, but we'll come back to John, John in a second. Uh, I think, uh, Jean, did you have a, did you have a question? Um, I just saw oh, that. Yes, um, hi, Sabina. Thank you very hi, much Jean. for the presentation. It's really fantastic to see your work. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, I, that last answer you gave just um, spoke very um, strongly to me too. Um, but my question was about um, video and um, obviously you, you entwine your video work with your music work very closely and I was just wondering do you obviously have people who work with you or do you do it yourself or how do, how do you manage that side of it? I actually I just started I mean <laughs> I, um, it started with Landscape Quartet because in, when you are in an artistic research project, you have to document everything. That's like kind of part of doing artistic research. That's what I learned. And uh, I didn't have a camera. I really started everything with, with like, I just had, had a tablet, like Cairn and Clovelly Beach. I just put up my tablet, which was on Clovelly Beach very interesting because nobody did see that I do recording. So the people behaved totally normal like it's totally normal that somebody's playing piccolo flute on the beat <laughs> so there was really no irritating of like um now i i bought like for for the recorded landscape series i bought a little camcorder but i do mainly everything on my own just the documentation like just the solo piece i had somebody who was filming me because i thought that's too much i cannot to be on both sides somehow. Um, I was first of all, first I thought I will want to have somebody who's filming, but then the intimacy is gone. Like either it has to be somebody who's really then involved in the project and is part of it, which can be actually, um, but just to have somebody who's doing filming wouldn't fit because uh, it, it was such an intimate process with all my co-players, a third person just observing wouldn't be right. It, it needs to be somebody who's then part of it, actually. But this is possible, you know, like to, work, to do work together with a film, like a filmmaker and then um, putting this together. But, but it couldn't be somebody who's just documenting. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Good question um, and great response as well. So we have time for one more question, John. I, I guess you have the honors uh, as you've uh, requested a follow-up. So uh, please go ahead. Well, like like Paul, I'm uh, very intrigued by this idea of tuning in, and there's kinds of concepts I've been rolling around in my head or the a similar kind of nature and I think I think one of the kinds of things that some of these concepts are doing is they're trying to mess with ideas of micro macro it's so it's not like you have big concepts and a big theory that you apply in a local spot or you just have local things that you do which have no bigger picture these are concepts which are trying to um, do things about micro macro relationships and bring things together gather things up in a in a locally situated way but not in a way that's just um, entirely specific something which has some kind of further inspiration or implication and I I think that's a real interesting zone to try and fight with and grapple with and I, or address and and for me, actually, I, I found in listening to your your pieces, the the things I found most successful, I mean, I loved every moment, but the things I found most successful 
where, where there was some kind of alignment or correspondence uh, where, for example, um, there was a correspondence of atmosphere, landscape, gesture and music in, in, like a, in like quite a material way as well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, quite a local material way. Uh, but yet in a way which was still expansive and suggestive. And, uh, and I wonder whether, I don't know, the very idea of tuning in or whatever it is that we're, we're working with here, I wonder whether that's, there's, there's some sort of lesson there. Um, the, these sorts of correspondences that mess with our otherwise dualistic ways of thinking. Um, well, uh... I think this micro and macro is definitely something I um, I didn't say this today, but very often I call like the microcosmic sound world of my flute because the inside flute and I mix it with the outside, the macrocosmos. Mm, mm, mm. And that's that's kind of a, an idea I have for a long time um, or I call it like this for a long time. And I think also this tuning in, it's it's your inner landscapes. You're connecting with the outer landscape. Mm -hmm. And um, and as I, I mean, going back to the quote of McFarlane, so this landscape mm -hmm. knows something about you that you don't know, or, or maybe you learn something from the landscape. And I don't know, I experience this a lot, then I'm, I have a problem and then I go out in nature and problem is solved all of a sudden because there's something hitting me and a thought which might come from myself but maybe came also from the outside somehow you know that's like very intuitive moments also and um uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> I, don't know if this answers, I don't know if this answers your question but I there say. is definitely something about the inside and the yeah. outside and it's also um you know like you bring the outside to the inside you bring the outside sounds to the mm. inside but then you're treating it for an inside concert but this is also my struggle i have you mm -hmm. know how do how do i bring this experience i had outside like really this amazing experience mm -hmm. is it ever possible because it's also very subjective this experience is it will it be ever possible to bring this inside and and i mean everybody has to do its own subjective um experience but but this intensity is it possible to bring it to the audience to transmit it to the audience that's a big question i have <laughs> well I, I think maybe maybe bennett helped you there didn't he i mean with that kind of preparing people to you know get them in a situation I mean, yeah, they, yeah. that they can be part of that yeah <laughs> i was just reminded when you said about going out uh, i think nietzsche said once that there was not a philosophical problem that couldn't be solved with a long walk Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. 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 Very, very quickly, Jean, and then we'll have to. Sorry, actually, not Jean. Uh, Madeline, uh, and then we'll have to yeah. wrap up. You know, yeah, it's not so much a question. Um, you know how you said, "Oh, how can I bring this experience to the audience?" Is it that necessary, really, to bring the experience rather than a memory, relaying a memory to the audience? Yeah, but it's my memory, so I have. Yeah, yeah. I should trigger memory inside. It's not the, to bring the experience. That's not possible. That's true. But maybe it's a certain kind of intensity. Or yeah, I like the word intensity that you used yeah. there. So, yeah. so, so that an intensity that then offers a a, a related experience. But you know, yeah. uh, that's beautiful stuff. So, if if all of you could unmute your microphones for a minute and join me and giving a thank you, a uh, round of applause to Sabina. Uh, this is always strange over Zoom. But... Okay. Oh, oh, and, um, there's <laughs> one thing I wanted, I, I, it's not out here. No, um, if you want to look at all the pieces, um, I, I just opened the full versions yesterday on Vimeo. So there's a presentation on Vimeo, you find it under my name, under recorded landscape number one, and you can watch all the pieces if you want.